Well, hello, hello. Google is finally shipping out the Pixel 6a to people who pre-ordered it's in real consumers' hands. I've been using the phone for a couple weeks now, and I have a lot of thoughts. This is a very different kind of phone than the Pixel 5a was last year. There's a new focus on high-end performance, and there are different compromises at play to keep a lower price. A new A-series which redefines what we should expect from more mid-price smartphones, but is the Pixel 6a the right fit for you? And while you're shopping around for good deals on your next phone purchase, we hope you'll keep up with all the work here on reviews.org. Hit those subscribe buttons down below, give us a follow around the socials, and check out our home site, reviews.org. We've got a whole team of people making you some really fun stuff that will hopefully save you some cash. Quick disclosure, at the top of this video, Google provided this phone for us to review, but they have had no influence or communication over the content of this video. Now, jumping in, saving money is the name of the game. The A-Series Pixels have been some of my all-time favorite phones. Not for my own personal use, no, no. I'm a power user snob. But for family and friends who want a great gadget value, these have been some of the best balances of performance and compromise. Google consistently delivers great camera performance, great lifestyle features, years of software support, and the Pixel A series won't break the bank. But we gotta break some of this down here, how we save money on a phone like this. The compromises used to be lower or middle tier processing power. Good, but not class leading displays and only adequate base tiers of storage. Up to the Pixel 5a, this was a recipe for critical success. The Pixel 6a is a little bit different. Google is no longer using Qualcomm chips in their phone. They designed their own system on a chip, SOC, called the Tensor. It first showed up in their premium phones launched late last year, the Pixel 6 and 6 Pro. Like Apple, Google is not making tiers of chips. So now for our new affordable option, the same high performance chip found in the earlier Pixel 6 is landing in the less expensive Pixel 6a. This significantly changes the performance characteristics and the value delivered, but I'm getting a little ahead of myself here. Let's start off with design. I think it's a good looking phone. It completes the visual language started by the 6 and 6 Pro. We have a two-tone rear plate with a visor strip for the cameras. It's clean, it's modern, and has an almost friendly robot aesthetic, which is fitting for a phone that is sort of the flagship option for Android as software. Flip into the front, it's looking real sharp. Symmetrical bezels border the screen. Just a small little punch hole at the top for the selfie camera. And overall, I think a lot of people out there are just going to dig the size. This is a return to a more pocketable and one thumb kind of phone. It's a little easier to pick up and put down for those daily communicator interactions. The screen is a vibrant OLED with respectable outdoor brightness. It's not going to win the high visibility award of the year, but it's plenty usable. It's capable in Southern California summer sunshine. This is where we got to do a bit of a response to some of the other videos that have come out on this phone. There's been some noise in tech circles about screen refresh. How many times per second the screen produces an image to animate motion on the display. The higher that number is, the more fluid the motion should look. The Pixel 6a cycles at 60 hertz. It creates 60 images every second while animating your app drawer or playing games and scrolling through apps. That's a high quality refresh rate still found on most nicer home desktop computer monitors. Modern game consoles still boast 60 frames per second. Like that's a pretty big upgrade from the last generation of games consoles. The $800 iPhone 13 still uses a 60 hertz display. You will not suffer on the Pixel 6a screen. It's gonna look real good. But why is this a conversation with the geeks? The phone's performance is fantastic. So you really have the animations keeping up with 60 frames per second. And it's exceedingly rare that I found any 
any minor stutter to the experience that wasn't created by a, a poorly optimized third-party app. Now, I feel some others have complained because there are a number of other inexpensive phones that offer 90 and 120 hertz displays, but it's even harder to maintain a consistent 120 hertz when you save cash on a lower power chip in the phone. I don't think there's any benefit to having a faster screen if the phone literally can't animate that fast. Sitting right in front of me right here, I have a fancy ultra-wide 144 hertz gaming monitor. If I plug this monitor into a tiny underpowered PC, and this PC can't draw 144 images every second to animate my gameplay, then does it really matter if I have a fancy monitor connected to this PC? No. That's not a great combination. It's more important that we fill the refresh rate of the screen, which the Pixel does in spades. And then with the 60 hertz screen, we also benefit from better battery life. The phone's processing capabilities are literally drawing half as many frames every second. It's gonna use a little less juice than a faster, higher refresh rate display. The Pixel 6a screen looks great on games and videos, supports HDR content. Somewhere along the line, a decision was made to keep keep pricing in a more practical tier. And this combination of high performance chip and 60 Hertz display delivers a great daily driver experience. <laughs> this is something we don't even blink on iPhones. If you want a faster refresh rate screen, you move up the Pixel food chain. You can go from the Pixel 6a to the Pixel 6, and it costs you about another $100 to make that jump, and then you'll have a 90 hertz screen. On an iPhone, you start with a 60 hertz display at $800, and you gotta go up to an iPhone Pro to get that 120 hertz. I feel the numbers on that hardware make more sense in Pixel land. Moving on, the fingerprint sensor is not my favorite. I'm really not a fan of in-display optical fingerprint sensors. That's where you put your thumb on the screen and the little light shines through your screen to look at your thumbprint. The Pixel 5a had this brilliant rear mounted fingerprint sensor, which was super fast and accurate, ergonomically located where your finger would rest. And it was a tactile landmark you could easily find with practically no muscle memory training. Pulling the phone out of my pocket, my finger would just land, the phone would unlock. In display sensors have no landmark that your thumb can find, they're slower, and the Pixels is one of the slowest of this ilk. I understand what Google's trying to do, there's a two pulse action on this. You feel one pulse to activate the sensor and then another verifies your fingerprint. But those haptics make it feel even slower than it really is in the unlocking action. I'm the kind of person if I'm picking up my phone, I'm picking it up with a purpose. I want my phone to be unlocked and ready to use before my eyes are on the screen. The Pixel is pokey with this method of unlock, and I've taken to pairing my phone with earbuds or a watch just so I can use smart lock, and the phone will unlock while it's in the proximity of my accessories. It's a little less secure, but it's just faster. But I mentioned the feel on that pulse and the haptics are great. The motor has a defined action, this nice little dop dop when typing. I wish the motor was a little stronger, but if I have to choose, I prefer the more precise articulation over just a dull buzz, fuzz, fuzz when interacting with the phone. This is a sharp enough articulation that it complements the Pixel's ringtones and it almost feels like a little subwoofer in your hand for your alerts and notifications. <laughs> Not that the speakers need much help. These are really good stereo speakers, not just for the price, they're just really good in general. Okay, this is really low hanging fruit, but take a quick listen against the more expensive at launch Pixel 5 against the newer, cheaper Pixel 6a. Which brings us to the software. Pixels aren't really stock Android in the strictest sense. There's a totally stripped version of Android that manufacturers build other customization on top of. The modifications found in the Pixel launcher aren't extreme. They don't visually stray far from 
stock, but there's a lot of code that pixels get first before other Android phones. Now that Google is using their own chip, their own SOC, and will code specifically for these hardware differences, I believe increasingly pixels will stray from traditional Android as their own subtle fork. The exciting bit here, services are not divided by price. What makes a pixel interesting is the attention paid to communication and assistant features. The Tensor is built from the ground up to handle more machine learning software on device. A while back, a lot of these features used to be server side, like voice transcription. Typing out what you say used to require an internet connection. The audio was sent up to a server, it was scanned, and text was sent back down to your screen. Google delivered locally processed speech to text that works great without a data connection. And it works in near real time on any video or audio you play on the phone. Even your own recorded home movies can have closed captioning. And that kind of processing is especially useful for things like phone calls. Pixels make for great personal assistance, where you can put a phone call on hold. You don't have to wait and listen for when a human is actually on the line. The phone notifies you when the other party is ready. The phone will make them wait for you. You can see phone menus broken down in text with easy ways to navigate the menus on your screen. And while Android in general is better for voice and assistant interactions, the bleeding edge of that technology goes to a Pixel first. All right, we're right on the heels of the official launch for Android 13. Over the course of this review, I maybe got a little impatient and loaded up the Android 13 beta on this little phone, and it's running really well. So buying a Pixel right now, at the time this video was shot, you won't spend much time on Android 12. Another brief bit of history, Android 12 had a bit of a rocky transition last year, but through numerous updates, especially the 12L update, those early teething pains were pretty well sorted out. Moving forward and, and using the Android 13 beta, we're continuing on a user friendliness path. Larger buttons, wider spacing on menus, and customization options that handhold a little bit more, like dynamic system color adjustment when you tweak your wallpaper, more app icons that match the phone's color accents. More than any other phone, pixels lean into that kind of user automation, but there's still some room for folks who like to dial in more specific customization. This is one of the parts of the video I'm here for, combining the hardware and the software. The Pixel 6a is something a little unusual for North America. When we look at phones internationally, we see more options for high performance in lower cost phones. We lovingly refer to them as flagship killers. In the United States, it's more likely that a phone in the middle tier of pricing is going to use a lower performance chip. Google isn't making a lower performance chip. They're only making Tensor. So the Pixel 6a performs at the same level and sometimes above its more expensive bigger brother. This changes the conversation a little for things like battery life, which we'll cover later in the video. But in terms of completing tasks, this phone is an absolute screamer. Now, a lot of reviewers like to show scores from these synthetic benchmarking apps. It's a piece of software, it runs a bunch of little tests, and then it spits out a number score. Those scores are often terrible at predicting real-world performance. This phone got the bigger numbers than the Pixel 6a. This phone costs three times more than a Pixel 6a, but if I wanted to cut up a piece of video, which phone do you think completed that task faster. I've been running these video editing tests on phones for years now, and I get a lot of comments. You know, people don't do computery things on their phones, and yet we live in a world of apps all trying to copy the TikTok. Enormous amounts of photo, audio, and video data are processed by smartphones. So even if you just want to trim a video a little for your own personal memories, cut the head and tail, you know, wouldn't you want to know which phones really do that better? A synthetic benchmark score can only really tell you how well the phone can run that benchmark. They rarely translate to real world performance. This is a $450 pocket computer that keeps pace with significantly more expensive devices and often beats them. This is what we mean when we say flagship killer. We make a few targeted compromises in some areas 
but we do not sacrifice performance. Tensor is a very different animal than the premium chips we're familiar with from Qualcomm, and competition like this is absolutely fantastic, as is the camera conversation. Now, Google has been working this image sensor for several generations of Pixel, and the processing is well honed for this hardware. Pixels are my top options for easy, point and shoot photos and videos. It really doesn't get easier to use than a Pixel. And I am including that other non-Android phone brand in this assessment. The interface is the least cluttered available. The most important information and options are easily accessible. Everything is solution-based. Instead of multiple camera modes and a pro mode, the Google camera app tries to find a solution for why you would need a pro mode. So you tap to focus and then quick sliders for white balance and exposure pop up if you need to subtly tweak a shot to your eye. You don't switch modes, you just add context-relevant options. And the autofocus. The autofocus is extremely sticky in a very good way. This is the best subject tracking available on any phone, any phone at any price point, and it just happens naturally. The user doesn't have to double tap or dig through a menu to activate it. I can't stress enough how organic a benefit this is. If you haven't played with a Pixel, and statistically it's pretty likely that most of the folks in our audience have not played with a modern Pixel, you take for granted on your phone the times where you tap on your subject and then you just need to make a little adjustment. You just kind of shift, but then you need to tap on your subject again. It lost focus. You never need to do that on a Pixel. You tap on someone's face, it sticks, and then you can move the frame around. Let's say you just want to move them to the other edge of the shot or adjust the exposure, and then you take your shot. It's simple. It's brilliant. And again, I've seen some complaints that Google hasn't included a more expensive, larger camera sensor in this phone. There are many mid-ranger phones that have included bigger main cameras, but a little perspective is probably helpful. What you're paying for here is the completion of the shot through the image processing. And in terms of consumer HDR, processing, color, point and shoot photography, this is one of the few areas I'd personally take the better trained software over a brute force larger camera sensor on a different inexpensive phone. This camera, backed up by a more powerful chip, we get better video capabilities, better video stabilization, better image processing, the same kind of HDR output in video that we see in stills. And that video output can be driven to higher frame rates and higher resolutions. $450 phones, don't always come with 4K at 60 frames per second. Google's recent initiatives for color processing are displayed well too. Things like more accurate skin tone for all people, but especially darker skin tones. It's a significant step in the right direction that we all benefit from getting better images, more accurate images of our friends and family. I've been rambling a bit in this camera section for the video. We're talking about the computational advantages of the Pixel, and there's one perfect example of this. It's all about trying to democratize really different photography concepts. So you try and remove something from a photo. Well, we've got Magic Eraser. A number of phones have similar plugins for their photography or for their photo gallery apps, but this is a really challenging thing for people to do in Photoshop, trying to paint someone out of a photo. Google has been evolving on this type of photography manipulation, and the new version of this introduces a feature called camouflage. Maybe you don't want to cut something out of the frame and kind of have a patchwork replacement behind your subject, camouflage will scan that part of the scene and subtly desaturate it to bring it more in line with the background so that your subject gets more of the attention. Really breaking that down, that's something that's not too difficult to do in Photoshop, but how many times are you going to take the photo off your phone, move it to a computer, paint around or cut out the distracting element, and then resave that JPEG? Now on a phone, it's literally just a couple little squiggles with your fingertip and Google's computational software does all the heavy lifting. Increasingly, when Android gets new features like that, they're going to go to Pixels first. We trade very little for that performance. And if you're still concerned about camera sensor sizes, the sensor on the 6A is the same size as what Apple put in the $1,000 iPhone 12 Pro. Now you can get similar photo and video optical performance for less than half what Apple put out for the previous generation 
of iPhone Pros. I think that's a pretty good deal. Moving on, radio performance has been solid. No issues at all maxing out my cable connection on a Wi-Fi 6 router. It's speedy. It pulls data down quick. It's shown virtually no difference from the Pixel 6 Pro in LTE and 5G use. And checking out reception in my neighborhood, which is a little more suburban, I'm more at the whims of carriers looking for good signal. The Pixel doesn't seem compromised against the more expensive Pixel 6 Pro, which that's not always the case with other manufacturers who often cut a few corners on things like radios and antennas. Again, I can certainly find some better performing premium tier phones. And I would say that the current radios from Qualcomm on newer, expensive phones, those are better performers than the radios in the Pixels. But keeping my SIM card in the 6 Pro for most of my time in between reviews this year, I haven't found a significant practical difference in web traffic against my Moto Edge Plus or my OnePlus 10 Pro. So I can't imagine there will be significant differences over time with the Pixel 6a. But that's gonna bring us to battery life. And as I've been saying throughout this video, the 6a is something a little different than the Pixel 5a. The Pixel 5a uses a medium power chip and had a big battery for its size and price. This phone is easy to run for two days under more casual use. Pixel 6a is a different set of pros and cons. It's going to run a lot more like a premium tier phone. This SoC is near laptop powerful and it still has to fit in your pocket. We really shouldn't be surprised when people say things like, this new phone runs warmer to the touch, or my battery life isn't as good as my old phone. The Pixel 5a is a fuel efficient four cylinder commuter car. The Pixel 6a is a zippy little V6 Roadster. And if they have roughly the same size fuel tank, which do you think's gonna get the better gas mileage? We're talking about real world use and the 6a in my hands is a make it past dinner time, but maybe not all night kind of phone. I do things on my phone. I play games, I listen to tons of audio, and it's not uncommon for me to cut up a video or mix down a podcast from my phone. I can easily drain it before bedtime, often a lot sooner. If your needs for a phone aren't that kind of high level, I think this is gonna be a very good daily driver. The Achilles heel of the 6A is charging. 18 watts is kinda slow these days. I'm definitely spoiled by more expensive phones. But if you forget to plug in your 6A at night, you can't really top it off fast in the morning before going to work. I'm getting about a 20% charge in 30 minutes, maybe a little better than that, ish. For a phone that can eat through your battery faster and is more capable at heavy lifting computer tasks, the charge speed is my single highest concern for the consumer experience. But when we add all those data points up, there isn't a lot that really directly competes with the 6A in North America. Samsung sells a somewhat mediocre mid-ranger in the A53. It has a higher refresh rate screen, but the chip in that phone does a poor job of powering the faster screen. And I'd certainly take the Pixel camera over that mid-ranger Samsung. Most of our other players in this tier are going to be lower performance options and will be better for outright battery life. And we're looking at TCLs, the OnePlus Nord, or Motorola's. But none of those options are going to deliver the same promises for long-time software support. Google committing to five years of security patching is kind of a huge deal in Android land at this price. I guess that leaves us with the iPhone SE. I mean, I'm still old and cranky and I definitely prefer Touch ID over Face ID, but the SE is getting really tired. Apple has been recycling that same phone since the iPhone 6. That's an eight year old retread and it shows. The 6A is going to have a much better screen, a whole extra camera, twice as much storage, better battery life on 5G, and if you buy phones at full MSRP, which you should never really do, the Pixel only commands a $20 premium over the iPhone SE. There's a lot of baggage that goes into comparing iPhones against Androids, but phone hardware to phone hardware, there's no rational recommendation for Apple in the sub $500 tier. So this is where we should totally start wrapping this all up. Pixel 6a, I'm very impressed. Google is unifying their product lineup. They're taking a page out of Apple's playbook, offering unique features, class leading performance, and promising long-term support. I cannot find any objective deal breakers here. The 6a punches 
well above its price tag and sacrificing a few luxuries like a larger camera sensor and the exclusion of wireless charging, this is a phone that goes toe to toe against significantly more expensive phones. There's a very good argument to pit this against an iPhone 13 and it wouldn't be an outright win for the iPhone even given the iPhone's eight hundred dollar price tag. Outside of the transition from mid-tier power to high power and what that does to your battery life, my other main concern is one of marketing and branding. There was a phone called the Pixel 5a. This is the new version of that phone, but it gets warmer and has poorer battery life. Yeah, that's kind of moving the goalposts just to find fault. I think we need to be more specific about what gadgets are the right fit for the right consumers. And if a family member said they needed battery life above all else, I don't think the 6A would be high on my list for recommendations, but it would still rank above the iPhone SE. If we're just lazily comparing phone labels, we miss out on what makes the hardware, the actual generational differences more interesting. And we're less prepared to make accurate purchasing recommendations, especially as we're getting fired up for a new school year. Maybe we can help some students out. Do you want a phone with a very good camera, very good speakers, and with the compute power to not only handle apps and games, but directly compete against much more expensive phones for gameplay. Are you or your parents really going to buy you that $1,200 Ultra phone? Because if you want more of the fun stuff, maybe you can sneak one by your folks shopping this less expensive sleeper performer. I'm just saying. And of course, we want to hear from you. This phone has started shipping out to consumers. Did you pick up a Pixel 6a? Some of those early bird pre-order deals were really good. Share some thoughts down in the comments below. Maybe we can help some people out if they're considering a purchasing decision. As always, thanks so much for watching, for sharing these videos, and subscribing to the channel for reviews.org. I'm Juan Carlos Bagnell, aka Some Gadget Guy, and I will catch you all on the next review.